Hey, my name is Ben Congleton. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Olark Live Chat. Uh, we provide the little floating chat box that you often see in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen online. We have about 11,000 paying customers from small businesses to really big enterprises. Uh, and our team's completely remote. We canceled our last office lease last year, but up until nice. that time, we were completely already working distributed. We were just paying leases on offices that no one showed up to. So yeah, that's, that's the, the high level overview of me. Yeah. How many employees? Uh, we have I think somewhere between 30, 35, somewhere in that range. It's amazing. Um, it's, it says 33 it's hard to keep on track of the exact, the exact number. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, you're in, in a really great situation in terms of Everything pretty much is that you didn't raise that much money or very small one. We yeah. raised, and I actually, I'm, I don't mind. Raise, we raised, I think, a total of $85,000. Yeah, so it's back then, YC, we went through Y Combinator in 2009. YC gave us 25K, and then we had some friends and family and fools put in. Actually, actually, maybe they put in just another 40. So maybe it's 65K, actually. Anyway, so right. so good <laughs> not, investment not for much. sure. <laughs> well, they, if, if they ever get any money out, that, that's the question. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, of course, because you don't have to sell anything, right? Right, because we're bootstrapped and we yeah. own the whole thing. And so, I mean, you know, like, essentially, there probably will be some way of returning money back to them. And, like, we could offer to buy it, yeah, buy, buy it back. out. Mm -hmm. so, so, but from their perspective, you know, the money is pretty tied up for a long time. Yeah, that's, so that's really a great situation. I mean, for me, that's a dream situation, right? You bootstrapped, uh, you, you got like very few uh, employees, a ton of, you know, customers. Doesn't actually yeah. that lead to sort of like uh, complacencies to some extent? I would say no way. No <laughs> way. I mean, I think that uh, for me personally, like the reason I do this stuff is to make impact. And yeah. to me, like complacency... I mean, I, I can see, I, I do actually know people who, where it does kind of lead to complacency, but at least for me, like the thing that motivates me to go to work is kind of the, the bigger impact we can make on the world. And so uh, I think, you know, if, if you were doing it for revenue, if you were doing it for money, or if you're doing it for lifestyle, it would be like a very easy, like, you know, SaaS companies typically are very profitable. Um, uh, once you kind of build up a customer base, it, like you're, you've de-risked a lot. Now, certainly like in our market, there's a lot of like VC money in it. There's a lot of very tough competition that is spending lots of money on ads and acquisition, which means that just as a core business, like chat's just an incredibly competitive market, yeah. which means that we have to build a great product. We have to provide really, really great customer service. And we have to just be like, pushing that and making it better constantly. So like just at, at a core business, we have to be making that better. But like for me, like that's, that's like, that's just like the basics on top of that. I think what makes, you know, running a business interesting and fun and something that, you know, we're, I'm like 10 years in right now. So like it keeps me excited is the fact that um, you're constantly learning and you're constantly sort of thinking about what's next. And because, uh, software companies generally have like pretty good margins you can choose where you want to invest that money like some of it's going to r&d some of it's going to improve your current product some of it's going to like marketing and stuff like that so there's a lot of like hard decisions to figure out like what what kind of what kind of business are you building and, and where do you want to go and so uh yeah i guess i guess you could say it it could lead some people to complacency but for me it just kind of uh this is always constantly learning. <laughs> no, I, I think you How nailed it. Little, little just, you know, every day. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you kind of nailed it. This is like more than just, you know, the money and more than the lifestyle and so on. So how do you make sure that you stay on top? So you have, you know, great profitability. I, I mm -hmm. you know, I would think given the number of employee and, yeah. um, and, and for, well, price from that- quite low. So I wouldn't say we're like super profitable, but like, I would say that it, we at least like, you know, we're revenue generating and we were able to bootstrap it. Hmm. Like that's, that's important. You're cash flow positive, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're cash flow positive right now, <laughs> so, but that's, that's a decision, right? You can always right. hire above cash flow if you want to. 
Yeah, that's right. You could actually be spending you know, a lot in marketing or all, all those other things. So Absolutely. what actually drives the decision? How do you come to, to make the decision? And do you have any advice for other people maybe in a similar situation in a very mm -hmm. competitive landscape? Yeah. And they need to figure out where do they allocate you know, their extra bucks? Super hard question. Like, I think there's wow. like so much context required. Uh, and I think part of it is just, I, I, I you know, as, as a bootstrap entrepreneur, I feel like you as an entrepreneur ha and uh, get to kind of build the company and the team that you want to work at. Right. And I think that's, that's important for people to remember, right? Like if we wanted Olark to be a sales driven organization, we could be investing our money in sales and in marketing. And there's a lot of great efficiencies and like known ways to innovate in, in sales and even you know unknown ways to innovate. So like, you know, you can really push that side of the business and you can grow that in that way. Um, uh, at Olark, we chose to invest in customer service. So we have um, you know, a very well-paid, incredibly smart, like customer service team that provides incredible service. Like and just like, wows me like every day when i have conversations with them like nice. I, uh, there are people that are like just thinking like constantly like how do we get better <laughs> at serving customers how do we uh make things easier for self-service how do we uh you know build better relationships how can we do things proactive so are, are we invest there and i think part of that for me is just because i've always thought that like the point of a company is to serve customers and and that's just part of my philosophy and then the other place we invest a lot is r d because we our product people, like all the founders of Olark were all product people. So we, we had four founders, all of us just love building stuff to solve problems. And so, uh, and I think like, that's just where we're coming from, right? Like had we been sales people, right? And been really good at kind of selling visions and then trying to deliver on those visions, I can imagine Olark being a completely different company, a completely different culture and the way of doing it. I think in our approach has been more like understanding problems, building stuff for it and caring a lot about the building and the refinement and like the the beauty of that item that we're we're producing yeah and do I you think, have some oh uh, it's it's awesome to hear that you know putting the emphasis on you know on support instead of actually seeing that like a cost center for example do you have some yeah. some example of how it really was instrumental to your growth this investment uh, in support or was yeah, it more well, like a moral at, sort of position yeah absolutely i think well uh uh, one thing that I've learned, because I talked to a lot of our customers, and in the early days, I did a lot of support myself, is that uh, people actually appreciate uh, talking to people that that work at the company. I know there's like this huge push, like, oh, let's go replace bot all humans with bots, and let's just automate <laughs> the whole world, and then let's just like lay back in our chairs, and you know, like, you know, the customers can talk to the robots, and we'll just figure it out. Like it turns out customers actually enjoy having relationships with the businesses they're working with. And when you have a relationship there, they will tell you what their problems are and they will work with you to solve those problems and making the product better. And so I think like uh, there's two ways in which I uh, can point to our customer service being helpful. One is that our tools are often used for a customer service team. So like naturally we had a strategic reason to be really yeah, yeah, customer yeah. service too, right? So our customer service teams speak in their communities and they speak not like as a strategic marketing thing, they speak because we've empowered them to just be a, a very smart and thoughtful team. So they're out there uh, talking about, uh, you know, different cultural changes we've done. They have a great blog post on design thinking and customer service, which I don't think like most customer service teams having the time to think about how to apply design thinking to customer service. Like just, just imagine like what that would look for the average cost center. It just wouldn't happen. So like uh, by freeing, giving them a little bit extra time, they've become, sort of a marketing community engine for us just naturally by investing in them and giving them time. Uh, the other thing that we hear a lot when we talk to our customers is that your support is amazing. And, uh, and that's not like prompted. You don't say like, oh, like, what do you like about our support? And they're like, oh, it's amazing. It's like, what do you like about Olark? And what we hear over and over and over again is that our customer service team is something they like about Olark. They always feel that we're completely transparent with them. They always feel that they can trust us. I think, uh, you know, by kind of coming at it from that customer service angle, it, it gives you a place of trust. Mm -hmm. And it also means we have a lot of the, like very strong, empathetic people in these customer service roles that really are just there to help. Like these are people that like volunteer and 
uh, you know, like they like uh, one of our one of our reps, Re, like she she uh, uh, basically runs her like little league. She's like the first female board member of the little league in her town, stuff like that. These nice. are like awesome people uh, that are like given a chance, like if you give people time to not just answer tickets all the time and actually think, you can get some pretty amazing, pretty amazing people and a pretty amazing outcome. So I think uh, one common problem and misconception is that customer service is either a dead end job or is uh, a complete cost center. And I think that uh, if you frame your approach a little bit differently, you can be kind of amazed at what those people can produce. Do you, do you have, um, so you have people remote for the customer support. Do you have them all over different time zones or are they all like in two? We've, we've kind of stuck to mostly US time zones. Mm -hmm. And uh I think it, probably a lot of that just comes from fear. Like I think that okay. we don't have a lot of it. So we, we like running our company with a lot of synchronous meetings. And so we never really innovated in going pure async for everything. And so uh, I think it probably is an opportunity to think about that, but we like being able to have an all hands call that doesn't have to, doesn't cause someone to have to get up in the middle of the night. And I think that uh, the majority of our customers for the most part, we do have, we do have international customers for the majority of them overlap pretty well uh, with EST and PST. So we uh, have great coverage in South America, we have great coverage in North America uh, uh, in terms of real time chat. And then we do uh, like overnight email. So, so we have coverage there, but uh, we haven't done the time zone coverage thing. We do have, uh, we have had people in Europe though, that kind of cover Europe, but we haven't, uh, we haven't pushed the live chat during those periods. Okay, yeah. That's interesting. And, um, and where do you actually go and find those great people in support? And how do you actually do that? Do you have like a sourcing process or, or it's more instinct? Well, how, how does that actually kind of work? funny? I mean, we, of course, we have a very well built out uh, sourcing project process, like our head of people is amazing, like Mandy's built an amazing process. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think it, the interesting thing is, is at this point in our business, it's like absurd how many overqualified, incredible people apply for our jobs. Like, it's like, it's sad. But like, you know, in a way, like, you know, I wish I was VC funded so I could hire more of these people, like, without worrying about paying, like paying yeah. for them out of revenues. But uh, uh, we probably get somewhere otherwise of like 200, like reasonably solid applicants for like one position, which is just like crazy. So there's just like, you know, there is some luck and who ends up getting hired whenever you have that many good qualified people. But uh, the process starts off and I can talk through it a little bit because it's interesting. Yeah. We'll post a job in a couple of places. We, were, we work remotely, it's worked pretty mm -hmm. well for us. Uh, generally, maybe a couple other job boards. We have uh, pretty strong relationships with the support driven people. Yep. And uh, so often we'll post stuff there, like, or maybe mention it in some of their Slack channels. And, um, yeah, and we'll get many applicants. Uh, and then we take probably, we screen as many as are as reasonable to do, like set up a screening phone call. And then we give uh, paid homework assignments for the first stage. So we'll pay you to like go maybe like, I don't know, do some fictitious support cases and just sort of write up your response and just give it to give us a sense for like what, what you're going to be like, like your thought process, how you actually deal with customer issues. Um, do not uh, follow that with, up with like a more technical interview, a, a culture interview and grab the top people, run them through a work along where we pay them to work a day with us. Uh, probably no more than like two or three people through that product. Probably, a lot of it depends on how many you're hiring at once, but this is kind of like we're gonna, we only have one position right now. So like two or three people for one position will make that last cut and then uh, hire who, do, who performs the best during that process and we used to do like fly outs and stuff like that but we we decided <laughs> like it's just like ridiculous like we we just do everything remote we're a remote company yeah. we should interview remote onboard remote all that yeah fly outs in all of america always uh airplanes just throwing the fly <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't work that well do, do you have any kpi so let's say that person is onboarded um do you actually mm -hmm. rely on any sort of like kpi to figure out like okay how is your support really doing 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Like what metrics to support doing? Like yeah, I, I find that difficult. Current, not, I'm not currently the director of customer service, but having had conversations with Emily, I think uh, right now they're, they're doing, they've, they've played around with a couple different metrics, like uh, customer effort score. Obviously, Olark gives you a lot of response sure. time metrics. Uh, and we monitor like chats needing review, which is a feature built into Olark. So like, for example, every, every after there is a chat, there's an opportunity to rate the, rate the chatter uh, from the visitor side. Not everyone fills this thing out, but like we try to tease out like the problem from the agent. I think a lot of customer service scoring is sort of done in such a way that it's very, very hard to tease out like problem sucked, got great service from like agent sucked. <laughs> and so like uh, we let, we tried that, we built a, a survey apparatus to try to tease that out and then um, so we pay attention to that sort of like our overall CS score coming through metrics in our uh, help desk software and in our uh, in our chat product. And then uh, so th those are more like quality and then quantitatively we're looking at like response times and uh, uh, probably like uh, yeah if I was director of customer service I could tell you like specifically with all the special metrics but I well, that's okay. We can uh, we can uh, pivot <laughs> that's a little a high bit. Level for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We can pivot a little bit and then say what what uh, KPI do you personally actually pay a lot of attention to at your position? Yeah, that's interesting. I think right now I mostly pay attention uh, at the stage and the place the company's at right now. I look, I basically look for net cash flow. Like net mm -hmm. cash flow is something I care a lot about. And then like within that, there's tons of SaaS metrics to play around, with, play around with, but. Uh, like at the stage of the company where we're, where we're at right now, we're, we're doing a lot of sort of R&D investing. And so to me, like just making sure that like, you know, the business works well, that's, that's my so main it's place the, to look at. So it's the CFO type really... of side more? Sorry? It's more the CFO type side at the moment? Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, like at a high level, like I want the business to function at this level. Cause especially like when you're making product investments and like longer term, when you're doing longer term work, right? Like there's metrics like obviously you care about like signups and new signups and upgrades and all that stuff like that but like like there's so much they're like when you do r d like some of the stuff doesn't pay off for a while so like you mostly are kind of like all right well what is our overall where's our overall trending look like and like you know how long can we give some of these r d projects before they pay off because we like having the opportunity to do longer investments rather than just sort of sprinting on things and just trying to like knock stuff out really quickly to add value but uh you know, that's, you know, you have to trade this stuff off and make sure you're allocating resources in such a way. Because we, there, there are certain kinds of projects we know that will generate revenue and there's certain kind of projects where we aren't sure, but like the upside's higher. So how do you do that with deciding what R&D project should go forward or not given you have a sort of like limited resource? Totally impossible problem. Right? <laughs> you no, know, it's like, you're basically are trying to be like an internal VC, but like on yeah. some level, uh, uh, we try to, it, it's basically the same thing as if you're doing a startup, right? It's yeah, like, right. you want validation. You're, this team needs to validate the work that they're doing, show that, uh, you know, they're taking the right steps. So, so when we do kind of like product development, which is, I think, the kind of R&D you're talking about, uh, you know, the team may be running kind of lean startup style and then mm -hmm. need to uh, create metrics. Now those metrics aren't necessarily revenue. Like their metrics could be like very high engagement or it could be like, uh, you know, they, they did a, like a hundred user interviews and they're hearing the same thing. Like just sort of think about like the different things that provide validation that thinks that it's worth investing to get to the next level. And those decisions are very hard because if a team has invested their heart and soul into kind of pursuing something and then they're not getting any validation, right? Like, you know, ultimately the company can't just like let that happen yeah. for too long, right? So you you kind of like there's a little bit of like gut, and then there's a little bit of uh, sort of like oh, like okay, well let's try to pivot this slightly and see if there's something else, or like oh, we just gotta like try something new here, and so it's uh, it's tricky. But I think like that that kind of stuff, like innovation, is something that I that I think is fun and energizing. It but also takes time. Like you know, when we were just starting Olark. We worked on that product for about two years before we had any mm -hmm. revenue. And I mean, we were doing it part time, but so once we went full time, I think we had revenue within like three months, but it was just like some, sometimes new ideas take a little bit of time. And so you're trying to like, 
just balance it out. Like, all right, is this something that's worth giving more time or not? And, you know, we, we try to look at our, you know, business performance as a whole. And uh, cause sometimes you really, you, you have these like great ideas and you really just got to shelve them for a while and, and kind of make sure you're putting resources where the customers need them right now, as opposed to where the customers need them in the future. So is that fair to say that you start with um, a metric in order to figure out like, hey, how can we improve that? Or is it more people coming up with an idea as like, hey, wouldn't that be cool? And then figuring out what metric will be impacted or how, how does totally, that come? It totally, totally organic? depends. Totally depends. Yeah. I mean, I think like uh, the way I think about it is uh, we have a mission, right? The mission of Olark is to make business human. This is something that this is a reason Olark exists. So you won't uh, launch a, a robot, you know, a bot launch, service. Yeah, we're future. not we're not building bots. We're not building <laughs> or, it, the closest we might consider building would be more like cyborg stuff. Like how do we All make right. people like really, really good? Or how do we take the things that humans do very, very well and help them do them better? Yeah. Like for example, uh uh generally humans are pretty good at at empathy and uh like uh making decisions in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, or at least they're yeah. willing to do that. And so uh, you know, let's let's leverage things that people do very well and uh, help them do them better. And let's not focus as much on like replacing rote tasks uh, with robots. Like I think there's a lot of technologists right now that are like, oh, how do we replace rote tasks with robots? And you know, I think that's an interesting problem space to play in. We're more interested in like how do we help people communicate better? Because people are going to have to communicate forever, and any innovation we make in human to human communication is just generally going to help us all off. And so this might be something like building a tool for self-awareness or a tool for uh, feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and the neat thing about that is customer service is, is very much like the process of listening to someone and taking their, that information from that person, uh, bringing it in your organization so that you can learn from this input you just received and then improving the organization. Uh, now, a lot of uh, organizations have breakdowns in that communication, right? Like a lot of customer service teams don't have time to produce insights to hand up or don't have a channel where anyone would listen to them. So like there's so much like in those like internal feedback loops that, re that lead to good service that uh, we think, you know, there's some opportunities. If we can improve feedback loops within organizations, we can help to provide better service. We can help the champion the customer service reps on the front line and we can help people uh, kind of think a little bit less about customer service as a cost center and realize that like the point of their business is customer service. You just happen to have a department called customer service, but the entire company is just doing customer service. Like don't treat one little limb of it as the cost center. Like it's, it's, there's, there's some, uh, uh, there's a lot of value there that you can capture if you think about it. Right. Yeah. So you start with your mission and, and how does, the ID come up for what oh, yeah, project sure. to do. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no <laughs> worries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not building bots, but yeah. So uh, where am I an idea? So uh, for us, like we have, we have a vision, right? We have a we have a place in the future that we are trying to get to together. And so uh, for us, for us, that vision is we're really trying to uh, build a business where we have a lot of customers championing people first business alongside us, right? We want to help. Uh, redefine customer service as a profit center. We want to help champion the people working in the organizations on the things that they can do really well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not on the, like, let's automate road task way, but let's help people do the things that are doing better side of things. And so given that, given that mission, all right, now we have milestones that we're working towards as a company to, to kind of like hit like this number we're trying to shoot for. And so now we have a framework in which people can say, okay, we got a, time box we got like this period of time we have so like there's some short-term wins and there's some long-term wins like what are some like product innovations right that might help us hit some of these numbers and like on a short term and on a long term okay which ones are we going to let's let's like put some people and have them think about this stuff and try to build some prototypes and validate these ideas for a bit and then see, see. oh hold on okay. So uh, the ideas effectively are part of the R and D, the process of finding the ideas. I believe so. Yeah, Got it. That's, that's my belief. I think you can kind of like. I feel like an idea itself is basically worthless. So you right. could say, like, "Hey, go check out this idea." But like for me, like R and D 
like that team should be built in such a way that if they change the idea, it's totally fine. Like it's mostly that they need to have a process, which they're, they're going through uh, a process starting with customer development where they're talking to a lot of people uh, in like some somewhat fixed set of people to kind of like validate whether that's actually the problem. I would say research starts with a problem. For me, R&D starts with a problem and the first step is validating that problem. And so like you might end up with Interesting, yeah. a different problem during that process and i think that might be okay but you know we can talk about like your your first stage of validation might be like oh you know we thought everyone wanted i don't know like cheaper socks or something like that <laughs> turns out socks are cheap enough but like there's an opportunity for like uh i don't know like like a casual sneaker or something like that that looks nice with dress pants or something not our mission, not our vision. So we wouldn't build any of that stuff. But like, if you were say Zappos or some other yeah. like company that was trying to move the, in the shoe industry, like you might take that learning and then decide whether the market was big enough to go like do some more validation. Like maybe is there an opportunity to build a subscription shoe business here? Like, let's go explore. What are the next questions we need to validate? You got your idea for the next business already. I can tell. Uh, <laughs> totally totally yeah, i've been thinking about that one really hard <laughs> a long time, I can tell. um oh yeah um how big are the teams uh, like um because like you mentioned this is part of your role to figure out about cash flow and making sure your company doesn't you know bleed base basically so how many is too many people to put in a and or do you do multiple teams and how big are the teams yeah, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't say that I make that decision directly. I would say that that is a decision made by my head of product, engineering, okay. marketing. That, that's more of like a management decision that we're, I mean, I would be a tiebreaker, but I would generally kind of talk okay. to management team. We'd work together and figure out like what, what made the right, made, made sense. Right. And so uh, I'm sorry, I don't have like a direct no, answer okay. for you there. It, it, it's just sort of like just context dependent. What it like, I would say start pretty small. Like I generally think a team of three is a good place to start on an idea. Cross-functional uh, or just one? Uh, yeah, cross-functional. Cross -functional. I would try to put a PM or someone who's as close to a PM as possible on that team. Okay. Uh, we have had some bad luck not having a PM on that team. <laughs> like I would say like we've been kind of figuring out what works for us during this whole process yeah. too. I mean, it started off of like, hey, let's see if we can build a new product. Like with, let's just take three people and like put them in a room and like give them a process and see what comes out the other end. And then we've kind of decided like, okay, well let's let's formalize that a little bit. Maybe it's not three any random people. Maybe you need this skill set on, on a three person team. And, uh, you know, this is just this is again. I would say like a small piece of the business is just kind of interesting to talk about. Like for the most part, like like resources are allocated towards uh, improving the core product, and the process is not so so different in the sense that you're talking to customers, you're testing uh, theories, and you're focusing your effort to sort of like provide the most value in the shortest amount of time, uh, ROI, like optimizing for ROI, more or less. Like maybe you need to invest a little bit more to like uh, make a radical innovation, but like it, you think it's gonna be radical as opposed to some small incremental improvement. And there are like 10 incremental improvements you can make. Okay, so let's touch uh, a little bit about that, about, you know, how you you prioritize maybe product innovation. And also, I'd like to tie that to how do you consider, maybe we can start with that. How do you consider the competition in regards to, to features and what the market is demanding? I would say I personally don't like thinking about competition. I don't mm -hmm. think it's super useful to do. I think that... Uh, if we were sales driven, for example, I think that would be like oh, a very reasonable place to start, but we're like customer driven. So we talk to our customer base, we understand what our customer base needs and we build what our customer base needs. And, the, and our customer base tells their friends and their friends come join us because our customers are very happy with what we provide. And then, you know, like you identify niches and groups of customers within your customer base that you serve very well. and. Uh, generally speaking, right? Like most people who choose your business are looking at all the competition anyway. And so they've decided that you're the best fit for them given their, their needs. And so, uh, you know, in a way it's kind of like a backward way of looking competition, but like it, 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 I think is a lot more motivating for a team. And I think the key thing is that, uh, on the internet markets are very large. 
and it's possible to carve out like pretty big niches. There's plenty of companies out there that no one has heard of that are doing tons of revenue. That's right. That people don't even realize are their competitors, like, like in the same industry. Like, I think right. like paying attention to a couple of competitors that are spending a ton of money on marketing, R&D, and uh, marketing in particular, is something that a lot of entrepreneurs and small businesses end up doing because you're like, oh my God, like this company is going to eat me for dinner. You know, I uh, like, <laughs> there are so many CRM platforms to compete with salesforce.com that are crazy. profitable and make money that no one has ever, that you, that you have never heard of, I know. but the <laughs> customers in that market have heard of those companies and like, and they choose to go with those companies over Salesforce all the time. Yeah. So, so I think there is a, I don't, it's interesting, right? Like, it, it, like we at one point had some, some members of our marketing team that were always looking at competition and it just, just didn't make any sense. Like it really, like, I, I, I think starting with the customer is the right way of framing it. And, um, and otherwise it, it just kind of, I, I just don't think it's, I don't think it helps you build the right kind of business if you're all focused, if you're always focused about what your competitors are doing or trying to like position yourself against your competitors. I think you should be thinking about how you can provide the most value for your customers, put 90, 99% of your thought there. And maybe you can throw in like a couple of percentage points thinking about how to like message it. So that your customers are clear what the value is versus the competition um, using the words that are like the right words for your customer base or something like that. But. Uh, that, yeah, that's my that's my thinking. Yeah, it is, but you do have um, a very large base of customer, like from you know, like the startup, uh, individual yeah. project, uh, consultant to like you mentioned, enterprise. So you sure. need to prioritize at some point some of the key features because the resources are not infinite. What's Absolutely. your uh, What's your thinking? You know, you were talking about niche for for, yeah, for yeah. the competition. I think as a small opposite. company, yeah, I think uh, I think as a small company, you have to pick a profile of customer that you're trying to serve incredibly well. I think, uh, you know, we were very fortunate that when we started, there was not a ton of good competition in our space. And so we were able to grow incredibly fast because there was uh, like this hole in the market of basically like an easy to use live chat product you could add to your website that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I think that seeing our success, there's been a lot of other companies kind of popping up and that's no longer uh, strategy like a like a sustainable strategy for growth like you know it, it helps being big but like just being the first is not like is, is not how we can look at ourselves at all and so um, I mean the way that the way that we do it is we have a, cus a couple of different customer profiles that we believe we serve very well and then we build features for those customer profiles so that those customer profiles can uh, get the most value from the product and then we think a little bit about how like these customer profiles, you know, might gain value from uh, competitors projects to some extent, but like very limited. I think we mostly focus on like, given what we know about their business, about the context of their business, about the way that they use software, how they sit within their organization, how do we provide the most value? What are, like, how do we help them meet their challenges, their goals for the year, that sort of stuff? How do we get them promoted? How do I help their team level up? I like that. That's, that's where we put our brain power. Uh, in, in 10 years, you must have seen that customer profile changed or did it not? I would say we were very unsophisticated for many years. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so I would say that we, uh, that if we were like, if you knowing what I know now and you gave me a time machine, you, know, you look like who we're building for and stuff like that. I mean, in the beginning, we we're probably just building for everyone. And yeah, yeah. Like, over time, we've realized like, okay, our sweet what, what introduced this uh, sophistication? Where did that come from? Uh, phew, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, in a way, I think it's a little bit necessity. I think like as more people enter the market and we realize that we were being not very rigorous about how we we're approaching stuff and finding ourselves being unfocused, we look for tools to help ourselves focus better. And uh, through talking to smart people and having conversations, uh, reading, you know, hiring more experienced manager management team, stuff like that, all this has sort of helped us over time become more. Uh, more focused. I think it's uh, a lot of these are tools used to help focus. Do you have an example of some of those tools that you use? Oh, like like just an example of a tool would be like having a user profile, right? And like and then going and then using that <laughs> using that framework, right, to evaluate features that you want to build. 
based on the value to that user profile. Like that, that's an example of, of, a, of a tool, right? Like I'm, I'm using tools in the like broader sense. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and I'm all for it. Yeah, Do you yeah, have yeah, another, yeah. another example of a really good tool that really helps you out? Oh, okay. Well, focus on it. Yeah. So I think like making sure product and marketing are very focused on the same customer, just period. I think that's, that's completely essential. Uh, I mean, ideally the whole company, right? The whole, like aligning the whole company around a particular customer segment, especially when you have such a diverse group of customers. Uh, and then, you know, there's ways of kind of extending that alignment in certain ways, especially when you have a diverse customer base. It's just sort of like, okay, uh, hey, we understand we have this diverse customer base. So here's our, like, our top three profiles or something like that. So as we're allocating engineering resources, let's think about these top three profiles and make sure that they're, uh, they're considered in some of that decision making. I think it's a lot of the ways I, I look at uh, decision making is having a framework for making decision making that is consistent. And, uh, and there's many ways of, of doing it that we're talking right now around kind of like customer profile level consistency but there's also consistency around like value driven consistency uh mission driven consistency and it kind of like helps people feel like they're part of something bigger over time and they can and it helps individual engineers and project managers and just your team kind of see the big picture of what's, what's going on how do you get your entire team aligned do you have any uh, advice, time. especially? I feel like time and repetition are probably like, <laughs> they're probably the only thing I've seen work. Uh, I yeah, I don't, I I can't say that I figured that out yet. Uh, <laughs> I've given my best did. shot. My best shot would be uh, have build a collaborative vision setting process. Mm. Uh, I found that to be very helpful. Uh, for how how do you guys do that since you're remote? Like, take take us a little yeah. bit through that. Some uh, advice because remote just is, did this. is something so that has some can, challenges. Uh, I'd have to probably look at some of my notes, but like uh, I did this like I don't know a quarter or two ago. But let's see, what did I do? Um, how did I do? It? So so we had a small group of people decide they were going to be on the vision working group committee, and then that small group let's see give me a second to think through this process so okay so i can explain it like succinctly uh so one, step one build a vision working group step two uh make sure that vision working group is like reasonably representative across the company and everyone there is is fairly passionate and those are people that the rest of the company uh values their their opinions mm -hmm. like you know if you can get people outside of management i think that would be ideal um and uh, I, I followed a process that was sort of, I, I did sort of two things in parallel. So uh, I'm a big fan of Simon uh, Sinek or Sinek or however you pronounce his name, it starts with Y. And so uh, he put out through kind of this consulting firm that he works with this book on like uh, how to get to Y or something similar to that. It's like a follow-up. Start with, with Y, I think, right? Well, this is a follow-up book oh, to It Starts With Y. This is the one that's like, here's how you run a workshop to get to start with why. And so oh, there's a couple of, there's like some good advice in that book around mm -hmm. how like some questions to tease out uh, uh, things that motivated people in your company. So uh, there's a set of questions in there. So we ran, so this working group ran a uh, uh, kind of a, a survey, like company survey asking a couple of these workshop questions and got back a bunch of information about sort of what was, um, what was, uh, I, I don't know, sort of like, like what people in the company valued that they had seen happen in the past. And this was, this was in a way kind of like a, uh, uh, a gut check, because I, I kind of wrote a version of a vision. And then uh, I had everyone in the workshop, working group also were, wrote versions of vision. We kind of like had a big discussion around it. Uh, it pro we try to keep pretty short, like 600 words or less. Mm -hmm. And then uh, kind of consolidate this. I mean, we're a very kind of, uh, it was process was driven by me, but I'm very, uh, I like to hear input and I know that I'm not the smartest person in the room. And I like to kind of like bring together people to produce something that's better than I could do myself. And so vision working group is an exact uh, example of that old arc is a great example of that. Uh, I think it like that pattern seems to extend in my life. So, um, you, uh, so we got smart people together. We come up with something we think is pretty representative of what like we think. Uh, where we think we should be given our values 
uh, in the given our mission, making business human is a period at a specific time of the future. Mm -hmm. We said like 20, 25. And, uh, and once we had that, then we went out and ran that survey and like asked people questions. Then we like showed them like kind of like a one liner version of that, like one pager and said like, you know, does this resonate? What do you think about this? Like, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, got a bunch of good feedback, iterated, got some more help, iterated. Uh, and then, you know, sort of sent our, sent our draft and just said, hey guys, like, you know, just capture what you, what you were all thinking. Like, is this motivating? Is this inspiring? Uh, if so, sign off on it. We've been, I love, I love his remote team making people sign off on things because it forces <laughs> them to actually read it. And I can go like bug them if like they haven't read it and have a conversation about things. So it's basically team. Google Doc, right? Mm -hmm. So you have Google Doc at the bottom, you let people initial it. Uh, we let people initial it with like an emoji and then kind of like a fun oh, phrase. Nice. So, so it's kind of cool to engage. And, and then, uh, yeah, that actually the first time I've done that and it was, it, it's like awesome. Cause you like go on the dock and there's just like a bunch of emojis with like, they're all different and like a bunch of like cool, like, yeah, let's do it kind of things. It was, nice. it was very fun. D did you have anyone uh, who actually felt like didn't resonate at all with what was produced? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we do a lot of, we do, we kind of screen for what we're trying to do on so many levels, like from hiring, just like throughout, like, I don't think you'd last too long at Olark if you didn't actually align with our, our values and our values, I think in many ways, uh, were highly reflected in that vision of what we wanted to accomplish. And so, and this is kind of stuff we've been talking about, like for a while in like abstract terms. And Got this it. was just a way of making it concrete and giving something like something to point at and be like, Hey, that's where we're trying to go. And then once we had the, hey, that's where we're trying to go, uh, worked with the management team to break it down into milestones for like six months, 18 months. And then uh, again, this is like, not like, hey, we're gonna launch this feature. Like we try, like, this is more like, we wanna have like this, we wanna like, you know, we wanna, these are more kind of like key results basically, more or less is sort of like vision, mile, vision jumps to milestones. Milestones, yeah, six months is pretty country, concrete. 18 months is pretty abstract. Uh, then uh, six months, you know, basically describe that milestone with key results, assign those milestones to directors, directors, or this part, like basically collaboratively, like create the key results for that milestone of the management team, and then uh, give, give kind of ownership over pieces of those objectives of management teams and just let them run it. And, and then have the the OKR process theoretically go throughout the company from there. But again, like OKRs is something we've basically failed at a bunch of times. I think the best advice I've gotten recently there is one, your vision should be like a sentence that everyone can remember. And your milestone should be a sentence everyone can remember. And that uh, you're gonna have a lot of repetition in this process. Uh, but what you really want is commitment from your team to actually do it. And so you want to make sure people are actually committed. And if they aren't actually committed to accomplishing what you want to do, you need to ask them, what would it take you to be committed to this? And then you can have a conversation about it because without commitment and accountability to that commitment, uh, again, you will have a team that is doing stuff and will probably enjoy like a reasonable culture but like you won't get to where you're trying to go. And I think like all this stuff I'm telling you, these are like learnings I've had like in the last like weeks and days and months. I mean, this is like, I've been doing this for like 10 years, like constantly learning. Yeah, what are, what are some of the uh, latest learning that you uh, you had? Um, I mean, I would, I would be the like one sentence vision, make sure you have it, make sure everyone knows it. Communication. Um, mm -hmm. That would be important and make sure they actually are committed to doing it. And it's not just kind of like, you know, whatever, you know, sure, sure, Ben, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Whatever you say, no, people need to actually be fired up about it. Yeah. And, uh, next learning, I don't know. What's another reasonable learning, uh, accountability structures are tricky when you're trying to create a lot of autonomy. Yeah. Tell, um, us, tell us more about that. Uh, what well, do you mean by that? well, I think that, you know, like here, here's an example of a challenge we currently have. So we have, um, uh, this is actually a pretty common setup, but we just haven't fully solved it, I would say. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, uh, talked before about these teams of three, right? A team of three might have a designer, 
an engineer MPM. product person slash mm -hmm. engineer or something like that. Um, so uh, well, maybe like maybe you have a team four. Let's say you have a team four. You got a product manager, you got a designer, you got two engineers. Uh, how are you assessing whether the engineers are great, are doing great, great job? Performance. Are they performance hitting the goals of the PM sets, right? Yep. What does that tell you? It tells you that the PM and the engineers are aligned around the goals they're setting and they're able to hit them. It doesn't necessarily tell you if the engineer is doing good engineering work. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So how do you sort of create professional accountability for engineers on product teams? Like that's, that's like a challenge that we're currently trying to solve as a small company. You know, if you're like Google, you might put a, you would have like a bigger team size. You would have very organized, like, like uh, management structure mm -hmm. where you could probably put like a full-time people manager that was like thinking about how to maybe run, you run like 360 reviews and you can like, uh, uh, like compare them across like other teams that you've seen based on performance and stuff like that. But as a smaller company, we don't have as much information. We don't have as much data. And so, so like, just how do you, how do you do that? Right. Cause you don't want to be like, Oh, you didn't build that thing that you said you're going to build when like, Oh, it was like poorly defined or that kept changing or whatever. Right. Like there's just, mm -hmm. there's some, uh, there's some complication there and also making sure that like people aren't just kind of like, Oh, you just do whatever the PM says and then you're good. Like, I think, I think just sort of figuring out that, that dynamic of making sure people are able to, able to creatively solve problems, feel autonomous and still all be headed in the right direction from engineering is something that has been a challenge for us. Cause for, for the first couple of years, we were basically flat, basically vote with your feet, basically just kind of like do whatever you think is right to move the company forward. And that broke down after a while. And then, uh, it's taken us a while to figure out like what, how, culturally we want to run the company and i think that it's from my perspective i always want to build a company where i would be happy being the ceo or the next hire and i think that is uh you know i think i think we've been true to that which has been incredible but it does make it does make it difficult i think because there are, are many ways of organizing companies where the ceo would never want to be the next hire i tell you that like <laughs> they would never want to be the next hire like, <laughs> They'd be like, ah, oh, you know, like I only want to be at the top if I'm being this work. So I think that, uh, uh, I think that's an important thing to think about as you're building a company, uh, and it does make it more difficult because there, I think there are less patterns to follow for that particular model. And so uh, it means you got to have like a like a good cohort of people to get advice from that are in a similar world to you. And I think that's also been a challenge for me, which is being in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of VC backed, reasonably small companies that are about 30 people. But being a VC backed 30 person company is entirely different from being a bootstrapped 30 person company. Like for example, the amount of money people raise in like their B or C rounds, like, like, like for me, like if I had to burn off, like that would not get the company very far. Like it actually costs a lot of money to run a company. But when you're a, uh, uh, a, a 30 person, so like, all right, sorry, if you don't hit your next milestone, you're probably going to die. Whereas like for me, like I'm 30 for a company, but I don't hit my next milestone, I'm fine. But like, you know, like that is completely different in terms of like how you're running your company. <laughs> like for me, it's not about hitting the next milestone. I want to be able to hit the next 50 milestones, like 75% of the time. Right. I want to be around long enough to have sh those kinds of shots because I think those shots down the road are going to be like super exciting and really fun and interesting and exciting. And I, the average VC back company does not have the luxury of thinking of thinking like like I, I'm, I like that. And so like you know finding cohorts of people that are more are more in that stage. And I'm mostly talking about thirty person VC back companies. Once you get up to like maybe 150 or like a little bigger enough revenue. You're probably gonna you probably gonna be around for a while unless like some of the sides they want to get their investment out of you and sell you to like a bigger enterprise company, which happens fairly often. But like, uh, it's possible to kind of like hide in the shadows if you didn't raise quite enough money that people want their money out. But anyway, another story for another day. Yeah, not not for you. Any book recommendation that you have for people? Uh, two book recommendations. Uh, Measure What Matters, I found to be really good. Uh, oh, cool. And I also like uh, Radical Candor. Yeah. And once you've gotten through those, I think that 
from good to great is always a good fun one. Uh, Small Giants got me started with Olark. It showed me you can build uh, companies that can be great, yep. didn't have to be huge, super good learning. Uh, and then if you want kind of like, a, I don't know, like a fun, fun book, uh, Nature's Metropolis is pretty amazing. It's a story about how Chicago was built. It's kind of the geographical history of why Chicago beat out St. Louis, which is super fascinating. Uh, talks about refrigeration, the advent of uh, railroads, how that like displaced like all the barges going on in the city, like just freaking fascinating. Cool. Okay, and uh, last thing, where can people uh, get hold of you or learn more about you and your company? Yeah, absolutely. Just go to olark.com. Uh, if you want to reach me, probably the best way to reach me uh, is probably to email Ben C at olark.com. That'll be the best way of reaching me. Uh, you can probably follow me on LinkedIn as well. Occasionally we get really good, excellent culture articles up there, like the ones you were referring to. Uh, but I, I don't have time to go into a ton of detail on that right now. So anyway, like, All right. thanks. Thanks so much. Jeremy. Thank you so Super much, fun. Ben. Appreciate it.